Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manso. Tonight, episode 178, I'm joined by two great guests, and I will tell you, I lead almost every episode with that. Uh, one, because it's the truth. I really do. Like, if I had a shitty guest, I would just tell you guys, but these two are absolutely fantastic tonight. First things first, we have the kicker from the Friends University Falcons. That's Cole Thompson. He had a 40-yard field goal in our pick for this week's NAIA Game of the Week to take the Falcons uh, in a big-time win over Kansas Wesleyan. And then later on, I'll talk to Christian Hicks, the linebacker from Carson Newman. Their 4-0 start picked up a big top 25 win over D2 Wingate and... I'm telling you, both those conversations, absolutely awesome. The guys brought great, uh, great energy tonight, excuse me, and I'm just really excited to get into this one. I will have all your D2 recap for tonight from week three. Had some overtime thrillers, a couple of them that I'm really excited to talk about, uh, some really close, tight matchups. Then into week uh, three of Division Three football, excuse me, with Jimmy Martin. We've got some great games to break down. No match wars with tonight, so I will be on the scene for the NAIA coverage, so cut me a little bit of slack. I'm going to do my best there, but really some great storylines all around from all three levels of college football this week and without further ado i think we get right into that first guest conversation with cole joining the show tonight this man nailed a 40 yard field goal as time expired saturday to give the falcons a big time w at home the fourth down quarterback at friends university cole thompson what's up dude how are you I'm good, brother. Better that we have you on the show now. Fourth down quarterback is a title that uh, you have to earn. You certainly did that this weekend. Talk to me about it, man. That had to be an awesome moment. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. It was. It was a. It was a complete dogfight all game. So, it was. It was super thrilling to get away with that win, especially the streak that we've had against that team mm -hmm. over the years, and then the heartbreaker that last year's game was. So, yeah, definitely. Very exciting win. Does your leg feel any different after that win? Do you feel like you could conquer the world now? Did you wake up feeling a little lighter on Sunday? I mean. <laughs> yeah, I was I was definitely walking pretty tall for sure. <laughs> That's, I love it, yeah. I had some good posture walking around that night and then on Sunday, yeah. But um, no, it's business as usual now. It's on to Tabor this week, so. Hey, good answer. Good answer. We'll talk about Tabor later on, dude. But we're gonna we're obviously gonna focus on uh, on the kick in this weekend as far as this conversation goes. Let's talk about that game winner. Leading up to that, you're one for two on the day. The one had gotten blocked just prior, and so maybe not a perfect headspace to be heading into this one. Um, some things are just outside of your control as a kicker, and and that's just not a great situation. Where was your head at when you went out to uh, attempt this kick right at the end of the game, man? So yeah, that was um that was a really unfortunate situation because it was like game wise pretty much the same situation it would have been a huge field goal to put us up and so it was yeah it was definitely a heartbreaker to have that first one blocked but i've got a ton of faith in our snapper and holder cuz they're just i mean they're both so dedicated to getting that operation as good as it can be so we were on the sideline you know working it after that trying to figure out exactly what happened and just getting reps so i felt good going into the kick i mean i knew that 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 group of guys was going to get the job done. Hell yeah. I like that, dude. And so when you actually go through with the kick, I mean, did you know right off the foot? Because as soon as this kick goes off and gets off your foot, you turn around immediately. We get kind of a Jordan shrug toward the sideline, and the boys are going nuts. But, I mean, you looked at the ball for maybe half a second and knew that thing was through the uprights, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, it felt great. <laughs> I, I felt it off the foot. And pretty much, like, once I saw it go through the line without hitting a hand or anything, I, I knew it was probably going to be good. Dude, that is so awesome. I mean, that's just <laughs> confidence that uh, you have built up from doing this just time and time again, I assume. You know, immediately off the foot, and again, like you said, as soon as it gets clean through the line, you know the type of feel that you've got. You know, that, okay, that thing's probably pretty good. I've done this enough times. Yes, sir, yeah. Yeah, Dude, that, that was a good ass. Yeah, that's that's so sweet. That was immediately what stood out to me watching like the kick back here um, was like, dude, Im immediately, like right after it comes off your foot, you turn around just to the sideline. I thought that was so that was so cool. And that was the first win over Kansas Wesleyan for you guys in 10 years. The first time this team has been 4-0 since 2008. So many firsts for this Falcon squad. What is the energy like in that building? And more importantly, what is the ceiling for this team over there for the Falcons right now? We're fired up, and um, I mean, energy-wise, coming off of last year, too, going into this season, we were fired up. We knew that we had a great squad and that we're bringing back a great squad. So, um, I mean, ceiling-wise, there is none. We're planning on 
nobody's planning on on going home for Thanksgiving. We're planning on a long season. Hell yeah. So yeah, we're all we're all super fired up about the rest of the season for sure. I love that. That's the mindset you got to have. Guys that are that are bought into that. And and speaking of being bought into the style of offense that you guys play. And this one, only 22 passes attempted on both sides of the ball. That's nothing new for you guys. There actually was a game last year where there were no passes attempted that I know we put out a graphic for that was just to some people outside of that organization, maybe ridiculous, but to the guys over there in that building, uh, just uh, just another Saturday. But this one, 22 passes attempted from both sides, gritty win that feels like exactly the kind of game that you guys want to be in. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's our brand of football. We just beat teams down, beat their will out of them, and then second half is really where it it yeah. starts to pile on. But, um, yeah, I feel like Kansas Wesleyan, it was just – it was a completely different, like it was a different animal. It was the weather was a factor, and then it was a dog fight the whole game, which we hadn't seen this year yet. But mm-hmm. we came out. I mean, we kept the same intensity. Of course, I mean the first half we did struggle with you know some ball security stuff and a few turnovers, but intensity wise, I mean everybody was locked in. It it mattered more to us for sure. Yeah, and that's not just on the offensive side of the ball. You guys are just uh, absolute batting, battering rams, excuse me. Seven different guys on defense go back and register TFLs in that one. And you talked about it. It was back and forth, back and forth. It felt like the defense, a lot of times along the way, needed to step up big when their name was called. What did you think about that side of the ball and their performance on Saturday? Defense was so awesome. Yeah, we had um, – there was a couple unfortunate punts. I, I also assume the punting duties. Yep. And um, punting-wise, did not actually have a great game on Saturday. <laughs> Which, which I'll, I'll take on the chin for sure. But the defense bailed me out 100%. They were complete studs out there. They only allowed one touchdown because yeah. there were field goals and then the kickoff return touchdown. So, yeah, defense was just absolute dogs out there. That was a crazy, crazy one by them. Now, your final kick was good from 40. We couldn't tell from the broadcast angle, the angle that I've seen on Twitter. How far back would that have been good from? If I had to guess, I would only say like maybe 48 or 49. Okay. There's a little wind in the face. Yeah. And I, mean, I wasn't trying to like murder it because that's, I mean, if you overswing, then. I would say that's a real part of the kicking game too, right? And knowing that distance. And yeah, obviously when you get back to that high 40 type 50 yard, like 40 yard field goal is great in itself. But you get back there, eventually it's got to be, I'm going to swing and hit this damn thing as hard as I can. At that range though, there's still a level of precision and accuracy and maybe a little bit of touch to that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a big part of kicking. It's I, I like to relate it to golf a lot. Okay. Like if you try to hit a golf ball as hard as you can. Yeah. No one knows shit at golf. Gonna, yeah, you're, you're not going to square it yeah. up. It'll be a terrible hook or whatever. So it's got to be like a 75, 80% effort, but just smooth, crisp form. So yeah, I wasn't, wasn't trying to absolutely kill it, but yeah. No, I like that, dude. But, I mean, that's a massive win for you guys, and it feels like a lot of teams will get that test. You talked about maybe not expecting that back and forth, back and forth. Every team's going to get that at some point during the season. It took you guys um, to this fourth contest, and the fact that you can take that game, learn a lot out of it, but still get the result that you want. A lot of teams come out of that game with a loss in that column, but you guys remain undefeated is a big part for you guys. Back on the road this week, you mentioned it earlier. What do you know about Tabor, and what do you guys need to do to take care of business this weekend? Um, so yeah, we're not expecting, you know, to just walk over there and get anything easy. We know it's going to be another game and then especially, you know, playing early on the road, will add another factor into that, but we just got to keep playing our brand of football, play another full game. You know, we, it's the, it's the same issues that we've been addressing. We just need to polish up our game and we should come out with a dub. I love it. Cool. Thank you, my man. I really appreciate you. Excited to continue along with this Falcon squad. You guys play a fun brand of football, and it helps when uh, there's a little bit of theatrics at the end of things. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Have a good rest of your night, man. You too. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate Cole coming on. We're going to move over to the Division Two scene, and let's start things off with a brand new Power 10 from our good friend Wayne Cavati uh, for the NCAA here. Going down the list, for those of you listening, we've got Harding, Valdosta State, GVSU, Minnesota State, Colorado School of Mines, Slippery Rock, Kutztown, Pittsburgh State, Central Washington, and Ferris State. So, what stands out here? 
Pittsburgh State obviously taking quite the dip after the loss last week. They did bounce back this week. We'll talk about it maybe a little bit later. Central Washington continues to rise. The two best in the PSAC, Slippery Rock and Kutztown, picking up right where they left off last year. Harding remains steadfast. Number one, the Bisons have been incredible. They have been tough to stop. They do have a great test next week. We'll talk about that later on. I believe that's Henderson State coming up. Valdosta, things are going well for the Blazers in the Gulf South. Grand Valley remains at number three after a close scare against UW Lacrosse. Minnesota State has had a tough couple of contests as well. They look to dominate this week, though, against Minot. So, uh, very fitting to see the Mavericks in the number four spot. Colorado School Mines at number five. Man, they have eked out two very close games the last two weeks. But again, eat them out. That's the important part of the conversation. They continue to win. The ore diggers are finding ways to win these close games. And until they're unable to do that, until they're unable to win, I don't see them dropping outside of anywhere that top 10. They will be tested. They will be tested by teams like Pueblo, teams like Western Colorado inside of the RMAC soon, soon, soon. So we're excited to see how those matchups shake out. Central Washington continuing to rise. Ferris State without their starting quarterback uh, over there in Carson Golker. They're going to need to find some answers as they move into the heart of GLIAC play here shortly. The Bulldogs will, but if anyone's able to rebound from that and has the personnel to do it, it would be fair State. So, that is your Power 10 for this week. I'm interested to see what you guys have to say about this. I'd love to have Wayne back on the show sometime soon to break this down and discuss it further. But, let's get in to our recaps from Week 3 of D2 Football, and We'll start things off with our pick for the Division II game of the week, that being West Alabama taking down Gulf South Flo foe, excuse me, West Florida. This matchup for the Tigers, one that the last couple of years has proved to be uh, pretty fruitful for that squad over there in West Alabama. The Tigers had two interceptions in this one. They dominated the time of possession, 35 minutes to 25. That's a pretty great fashion. Also held UWF to 3 of 13. On third downs, the defense, I think, is kind of the story of this one stepping up. And when you look at the final score, 35-33, to 33, it might not seem like a defensive matchup. You have to remember this went into two overtimes, so a couple other chances for both these squads to score. And you pull up the box score, and I think that's what you'll notice, that this defense from West Alabama, as I roll some of the tape here, they certainly showed up and showed out. At the end of the first half, West Alabama led 7-3. to three. So this is not a game that was an offensive explosion from the jump. The third and fourth quarter saw most of the scoring, respectively, and then obviously into overtime, they added a couple points on each side. Over 5,000 people in attendance down in Pensacola at Penn Air Field. This is a home game for the Argonauts. UWA comes out. They start out to a 14-3 lead. Had a uh, touchdown pass. Had Caleb Bass catch that one to put them ahead. He actually caught the first two touchdown passes from Spencer, and uh, the first one being uh, 12-play, 75-yard drive, and then a quick three-play, 22-yard drive. Some great field positioning there for the Tigers. They just kept things rolling. Now, UWF fought their way back into this one, actually tied it back up, not until all the way into the fourth quarter with a minute left. A field goal from Cade Lombardo, 28 yards, ties things up at 20. It would go into overtime a couple scores later. We found ourselves in double OT, and that's when... Uh, Things ended up going south for the Argos, and the Tigers pull this one off here. You'll see as I fast-forward in the highlights, this is the double OT score from the Tigers on the quarterback run-in here. And then to close things off, it was, I do believe, the Tigers' defense shutting things down in the end zone. Not here, though. This is the overtime score from West Florida. Excuse me. Big-time pass there to convert in the red zone. But then as we add head into the second overtime, which, of course, the rules start to get very interesting. We go for these kind of two-point conversion type deals, right? And 35-33, you see it here, pass into the end zone. That one deflected, broken up, and that would be the last play. Tigers celebrate, pick up a massive win on the road for this program. The second year in a row that UWA has taken down West Florida, one of the, I mean, perennial top dogs in the Gulf South Conference. So certainly felt like that game had to be highlighted. Certainly earned our Game of the Week recognition for that. Now, let's move over to a cross-divisional matchup here against two really solid squads. One of them trying to rebound, that being the University of Central Missouri. The Mules 
Previously at number two in the country, they drop a game to Central Oklahoma. They're at number 11. They go on the road to Davenport and eke out this win. 32-31, to UCM brings home the one-point win with literally the smallest margin of victory you have possible. Now, as you see here, we start to roll the tape. Zabrowski, still very much a dog. Still can sling the football. Davenport, though, as you can see, did a good job of getting back to him, making him scramble, and make some maybe uncharacteristic type of plays. He still ended up having himself a day. I'm not going to make it seem like uh, they really contained Zabrowski because they certainly did not. When you read the stat lines here, coming off the box score of this one, he was 31 for 47, 349 yards and a touchdown. Did have the one takeaway, though, Davenport defense had an interception that certainly helped them along the way this was the story of the game for Davenport that would be Myron Harris juking people out midfield and just outrunning the rest of them and I'm going to talk about Central Missouri did a fantastic job of limiting the Panthers on the ground they held Davenport to a total of 55 yards rushing on the day but the big plays are really what hurt UCM that being the first of two Myron Harris touchdowns 60 yards and then 48 yard touchdown receptions for the running back from Davenport in this one. Those are the, the big plays that hurt the Mules. Can you look at every other metric from this game? The Mules really dominated. 33 first downs to 19 of Davenport. That ran for 150 compared to the 55 of Davenport. Total offense over 120 yards difference. They only punted the ball once. The Mules were... Uh, Five of seven inside of the red zone. So there's a lot of things going very well here for Central Missouri. Their offense was certainly clicking. Maybe struggled to finish a few times as far as touchdowns are concerned. You see the field goal here in the red zone. Not able to come away with six or seven points early. And this game early on was kind of back and forth. Central Missouri did have a safety here pretty shortly after these couple plays. Uh, Davenport led seven to five, and then going into the halftime, into halftime, excuse me, it was 14-12 Davenport. That's where UCM their offense finally woke up. Now, into the fourth quarter, Myron scores his second touchdown of the day. That made it 28-25 Davenport. UCM had to respond, and if I uh, move forward on this one, sorry, the highlights are, are pretty long here. But I want to move forward so I can make sure I see these. And Myron's second touchdown of the day right here. Nope, nope. Too fast, too fast, too fast. Here it is. Like we talked about, another kind of flare slash swing route on the outside. And he just outruns and goes through someone to the pylon right there. So that made it 28-25 Davenport and Selly up in the end zone. We got a combination of a couple different ones. Uh, but UCM would bounce back here. A cu nice couple stops on defense for the Mules. They get the ball back. Zabrowski looks downfield. He launches one up. And that was a tip drill takeaway. Their one takeaway from Davenport came in the fourth quarter. Now, a three-point lead for the Panthers. A takeaway in the fourth quarter. That could have been icing on the cake. And honestly, it was very close to being so. You see this deep pass completed here. And they would actually hold Davenport to a field goal. They had first and goal from around the nine-yard line. There's our guy Preston Smith right there making a big-time grab. They had first and goal from the nine-yard line. It turns into second and 14. They actually don't end up converting. There's Smith again trying to make a stretch for the goal line. They don't end up converting. They have to settle for a field goal inside of the red zone here. That makes it 31-25 to Davenport leading by a score, and Central Missouri needs to respond. They do, right up the middle. And uh, that's uh, Langelo Bell for Central Missouri scoring with just a minute left in the fourth quarter. This extra point, which was so close to being blocked, ends up icing it for the Mules. That's a really big-time win for Central Missouri on the road and a bounce-back win at that, dropping from number two in the country to number 11 and having to maybe look a little internally for the Mules. Everything, all of their goals are still ahead of them for that Central Missouri squad. I'm excited to continue to follow them down the road. Now, the next game we'll talk about, I'm going to go over relatively briefly just because... We have uh, Hicks on later in the episode. That's Carson Newman beating Wingate in overtime. Wingate coming in as a number 24 team in the country. Carson Newman, 31-28 in overtime. The Eagles, excuse me, take this one. Things got started off here with a field goal from Carson Newman. And as you break down the scoring, Carson Newman got off to a hot start here. It was uh, 10 to 6, really 10 nothing at one point. Carson Newman, Ethan, or Ethan Wallace would respond for Wingate and went kind of back and forth, back and forth into the 
into the half. At halftime, Wingate actually led 20 to 18. And like I said, I'm going to just quickly kind of go through this one. But what you need to know is that the Carson Newman defense stepped up. We're going to talk about it later. This team that is known for the triple option really stepped up and made plays defensively. They didn't even run for 100 yards. And typically with a triple option type of offense, that does not spell success. Carson Newman able to overcome that deficit. Made some big plays defensively. Timely offensive passing type plays against a quality squad in Wingate that we've seen go out and win a lot of these big time games. So a very big win for Coach Ashley Ingram and that squad down there and Carson Newman. Like I said, we'll talk much more about that later on in the episode. So if you want to hear more about that, wait for Christian to join us on the show. But we'll keep things moving here. Don't have highlights for this one, but number four, Colorado Mines. They go into Shadron State. And this one was very interesting for me. We saw Mines pick up a gritty win last week, very much in the same this week, although some different contributors as far as how this one got done. Last week, it was a 31-28 win at Washburn, a quality MIAA opponent. Now you start the RMAC play, once again on the road at Shadron. And... This was started very slow. It was not an offensive game at all. Mines ended up winning at 13 to 12. It was six to six going into halftime. A couple, uh, you know, one touchdown and a missed extra point for Shadron, and then two field goals for Mines. And I think some of the biggest points for this one, uh, Wilson Yee for Mines is probably or for uh, Shadron, probably one of the MVPs of this one, keeping them in this game, but it just wasn't enough, special teams-wise, the kicker over there. But neither team rushed for 100 yards in this contest. That feels pretty uncharacteristic of mines, and I know we've probably come to expect a lot more of the air raid out of the ore diggers, but for a guy like Landon Walker to only have seven carries for 14 yards, that Shadron State defense has to hang their hat on that one, even though they, they end up losing. Mines had better offensive stats on the day, had an interception and fumble, though, that stopped some of their drives, the ore diggers. And really, this is a team that's going to be tested relatively quickly here. We talked about it earlier when speaking on the um the excuse me, the power 10 from Wayne Cavati. And if I go to check out, excuse me, the schedule for the ore diggers as they move forward into RMAC play. Nothing crazy off the bat. They're at home versus Black Hills State next week, which should be a good rebound for them. On the road at Mesa, then at home versus South Dakota Mines. The big marquee matchups in the RMAC don't come until October 26th at home versus Western Colorado, and then November 9th at Pueblo. Those are going to be the ones that I think I'll mark on my calendar. But again, you cannot count out Mines. They still find a way to win these games, and that's important for a team of this caliber. Let's move over to the NSIC. This time, Bemidji State on the road at Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls coming into this one, I do believe, 3-0. and And uh, doing a lot of things right early in this matchup. Well, Bemidji, excuse me, started off pretty hot. They were the heavy favorite, the Beavers, in this matchup. When you look at the box score in this one, they start things off 14 to nothing, But they were outscored 17 nothing in the second quarter. So actually, USF goes into the half winning by three. Here's a quick highlight from Bemidji in the first, or the, in the fourth, sorry right down the sideline into the end zone. And I think what we've noticed here, the passing attack from Bemidji has certainly separated itself. Bryce Peters has cemented himself as one of the best wide receivers in the conference. Those are just some things that we've come to know watching the Beavers the last couple of weeks. And um, some of the stats, I guess the big time stats I pull up, I got another little highlight for you here. Oh, maybe not the same one, same one. Hold on. I'll figure my I'll figure my end out over here. But some of the big time stats, I think, from the Beavers in this one. 23 first downs to 11 from Sioux Falls. The Beavers had two interceptions, and I think that's what makes this game a lot closer than it probably was quote unquote supposed to be. And I, I, everyone who kind of looked at this game maybe was a little bit surprised by uh, the competitive nature of it. Um, but again, looking at this, Bemidji total offense, 417 yards to 286, had 35 minutes to 25 a time of possession. That's big time. Sioux Falls was 2 of 11 on third down. So that defense was holding the, uh, I believe it's the Panthers over there, to very little. Marcus Hansen, still very good at football. The reigning NSIC Defensive Player of the Year. Him and that uh, Bemidji front line right there, that front four, however you look at it, one of the best in the conference. So, Bemidji feels like a very well-rounded football team and, again, has the ability to win the close games, lost a tough one against Minnesota State, look for the Beavers to continue to rebound and keep building on this. But let's move forward here. Sorry, take a breath. This is a squad that we don't talk about nearly as much on the podcast 
That being UVA-wise, and we haven't really talked about them for a good reason. They've just struggled in recent history. Catawba comes into town against UVA-wise, and they pull out a semi-surprising win, 31-28. to They take this one. I do believe it's the Cavaliers. And... A fumble recovery for touch a touchdown for Wise that got gave them the lead in the third quarter and kind of felt like the tipping point for this one. Things were tied up at 21 in the third quarter. That fumble recovery touchdown made it 28-21. And then a tied up touchdown for Gataba. Uh three minutes left in the game. Jordan Crabtree hits what would be the game-winning 24-yard field goal for the Cavs. Let me see if I can't find that fumble recovery touchdown because that was such a big moment in this game. Here you have Wise driving down and looks like actually fumbles across the the goal line there. Uh, But let's see here. So that would have been quite the tipping point. You fumble across the goal line. Instead of going in to score, you turn the ball over. That turns into a touchback. And here we go now. I guess we missed the... Did it not show the... We don't show the fumble recovery. Or no, that must have been rule the touchdown. That's ridiculous. Okay. Anyways, there's a touchdown that ties things up. This would be the game-winning field goal off the leg of Crabtree that lifts UVA-wise to the win at home over Catawba. Um, nothing too big notes-wise for me on this one. Just wanted to highlight that feels like a very uh, good program win for the Cavaliers, a game that typically they may, might not have uh, come out on top of. So I wanted to make sure I highlight some teams that I don't typically talk about on this show. Four wise, Jake Corcoran, 27 for 38, 266 and two touchdowns. That feels like a great day for the signal caller there. Seth Fishbatch, hopefully saying that one correctly, 10 catches, 126 yards and a touchdown through the air. Some big time defensive performances from them as well. Uh, Rafael Mays second uh, had a pick for the Cavaliers. So we'll see if they can continue that success. But I've actually got like four more games that I want to highlight in D2. A lot of great coverage tonight. Let's move over. This one, again, will be kind of a quick coverage. We posted about it on the College Football Network. Clark Atlanta picks up a massive win over Division I. Bethune Cookman, hopefully I'm pronouncing that one correctly, not a team that I typically find myself talking about. This was the go-ahead field goal. Cookman leading 37-35 against Clark Atlanta until they knock this one through the uprights as time expires. On the road, they take down Cookman. David Wright, really the star of the show here. He was not the kicker. That would be Cabrera right there. It was his first career game-winning field goal, which you absolutely love to see. Not only first career game winner, it was a 55-yarder. Look at the hang time on this ball, and that cleared it, no question. You see the celebration there, deservedly so. Clark Atlanta picks up a massive win on their season. But once again, David Wright, who has been impressing under center for this Clark Atlanta squad, he was 30 for 49, 374, four touchdowns, did have one pick through the air, added another 20 or 30 yards on the ground. He has been stellar for this offense, and we've certainly recognized that. He was our player of the week selection, I do believe, a couple weeks back. So shout out to those guys for getting that result. That is a big time outcome. But Let's go to the GAC. We haven't talked too much about this conference. I think we need to rectify that. Number 17, Washita Baptist. They go on the road to Southern Arkansas. 25 to 20, they pull out the win here. They're running the rock, uh, was Baptist. 223 yards to only 86 of SAU. Uh, Southern Arkansas had 14 penalties in this one. That feels pretty noteworthy. The time possession, once again, dominated 35 minutes to 25 in favor of OBU, who was also 4 of 4, perfect in the red zone scoring opportunities. So, big time win for Washita, as uh, I do believe. I need to check, but I think that was their opener into. No, no, they've been playing. They've been playing in the Great American Conference. So, Washita improves to 3 and 0 after wins over Southwestern and Northwestern Oklahoma State respectively. Uh, that was their first real test against Southern Arkansas. Uh, but they're 3 and 0 in Great American Conference play. They don't really have some of the bigger tests like Harding, Arkansas Tech, Henderson, Southern Nazarene, those kind of players uh, in, until the end of the year. So look for Washita to continue to keep going. Speaking of Henderson, they pick up a big time win coming into this week at number 20. They host Arkansas Tech. And they pick up a 27-12 to win. Now, points in this one for you guys. Arkansas Tech finished with 27 net rushing yards on the day. 
the ready is absolutely getting after it at the line of scrimmage. They had three sacks, too, so that helps that net yard, rushing yards number. Time possession, once again, 35 to 25 minutes. Had a pick six for Henderson State in the fourth quarter. That kind of iced it. Colby Crawford picks that one in, and uh, th- that really would have been the icing on the cake that kind of put the game away in the fourth quarter here. Henderson scored 20 of their 27 points in the fourth quarter. This was not a game. This was anything but a wire-to-wire victory for the Reddies. Uh, they were down 9-7 to at half and ended up being a really close contest all the way until the fourth, and that's where the offense started to figure it out. Jeremiah Davis adds two touchdowns, and then Colby Crawford ends up getting that pick six to kind of ice things. So excited to see what Henderson State continues to do. They are at Harding next week. They're number one in the country, reigning GAC and national champions. If there's any time to prove anything, it would be next week on the road in Searcy, Arkansas. I am pumped about that matchup. We haven't really seen Harding with a great test yet. They've looked fantastic, but they have not played Henderson State. They have not played a team close to that caliber. So I'm really excited to see what goes on over there. Finally, on the D2 scene, we've got Texas A&M Kingsville against a UT Permian Basin squad that uh, has been looking a little lackluster offensively. Had that tough loss two weeks ago against CSU Pueblo and trying to rebound last week, in which they did. And this week, not so much against this uh, Texas A&M Kingsville squad. They take the win 20-14 to as I roll some of the clips here. It was a 10-0 start from Kingsville. The Javelinas would go into the half 17-10 to with the lead. And when you look at this one, stat lines that... Uh, Kind of stand out here. I'm trying to look through. I didn't have a chance to look through this one much. Permian Basin, we certainly have not come to associate with the running attack much, but when you have 46 yards on the ground of net rushing yards the entire day, it's really hard to win football games unless you're like Minnesota State Moorhead, Moorhead or something where you just live and die on the pass. Did have an interception on the day as well. That certainly does not help. Total offense wasn't bad because, again, that they really rely on that through the air. Um, but, again, when you go down to it, Texas A&M Kingsville dominated the time of possession. We're much better on third down. And uh, red zone-wise, UTPB 0 for 1 in the red zone. The only time they really scored was on some big chunk plays. So they were not able to finish drives. The Texas A&M Kingsville uh, defense was really all over them. You see here, 17 nothing lead for the Javelinas, and they were just capitalizing. That is until they did end up making some big-time plays. I want you here you go. They started to drive down the field. The Falcons did, but just too little too late. Not enough right now for UTPB, and uh, not a great start to uh, the lone conference play there. They certainly are not out of the picture or out of the hunt when it comes to like a conference championship or playoff berth, those kind of things. I think they still have the opportunity to go do that if they run the table, and, and I think that's still very much a possibility for the squad. If a team has the opportunity to do it, it could be this UTPB squad. But in the spirit of talking D2, let's go to our D2 guest for the night from Carson Newman. <laughs> Also joining the show tonight, this man, one of the leaders of the Eagles defense in 2023. He and Carson Newman off to a hot start in 2024, linebacker Christian Hicks. Here we go, man. What's going Here we on? Here go. Not much, man. Chilling, chilling. Dude, excited to get you on. Definitely not uh, not chilling, as it would be the word, after picking up a win over a top 25 opponent. I imagine that building was anything but chilling uh, on Saturday after that big time <laughs> win, dude. Talk to me about it. It was a great win for us. We we prepared ourselves all week. We uh, knew they were a talented team, and our guys just came in there, and we fought hard, and we got the win, and we were just happy with the results that we that we made. No, I mean, that's nicely said, humbly said, which is exactly what you're supposed to say, by the way. <laughs> uh, coached you up well, whatever PR coach you got over there. But, um, you know, listening to what Coach Ingram had to say, he had talked about how Wingate is a team that, that you guys want to emulate in a lot of ways and the way they had success and they're able to win football games. And so when you talk about a team that you guys obviously have a lot of respect for on the other side, and that's in that kind of the conference right there, a team that's had a lot of success in that conference, that's got to be a massive confidence boost for this squad. Now, being 3-0 and is a confidence boost in itself, but to go and do it against an opponent like Wingate, it's just got to take it to the next level, huh? Yeah, it definitely does. The coaches are not letting up on us. They're going to keep working us, working us hard. They're going to keep 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 us on track. They're not going to let us goof off, none of that, get lazy. So we have a, the coaches here, we have a great coaching staff that's going to just stay on us all the time. That's the way it's supposed to be, man. That's the way it should be. Now, this one goes into overtime, comes down to a kick. What is the sideline like in those moments? Talk me through that, man. 
we all have pretty much confidence in our kicker Bennett. Um, he he's been practicing all week. He worked hard for it. I knew he was ready and prepared, but you know, still on the sidelines in that moment, you know, you still gotta hold your hold your breath. You know, pray to God. You know, you gotta do all those type of things. Hold your teammate's hand. You know, it's a field goal. You never know what's gonna go wrong with a field goal. Dude, amen to that. The celebration afterwards is incredible, guys out in the field. By the way, the facility, it looks like, and this is just on me. I have not been hip to the setup down there uh, at Carson Newman. That place looks incredible where he's kicking to that, that kind of building over there. The reaction from Bennett as well after the kick, the big flex right afterwards. He was obviously feeling it, dude. That just that energy, that's got to be one of the top moments for you since suiting up for the Eagles, I imagine. Yes, that is definitely a top moment for us. We okay. haven't – I can't remember the last time we beat a ranked opponent. So it was just something very special to us. We took it very seriously, and we just have a long way to go. But we're just happy right now that we got the win and we're going into next week ready for uh, Catawba. Dude, you're coached up right. That's the right answer. That's the right answer. Those are textbook. But uh, <laughs> really, though, I am very excited for you guys. You had uh, a rough day running the ball offensively. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the defense was out on the field a lot. And that's something that usually leads to some struggles defensively when your guys are out there worn down. Uh, you guys, not necessarily the case. What stood out to you from the performance from that defense on Saturday? We never gave up. That was one thing we never did. We, uh, we was always taught to run to the ball. All 11 has at the ball. That's what we That's what we do in our defense. Constantly coached hard. Even our, the players, we coach each other hard. We get on each other, but we're able to take it. We're able to take criticism, and we're able to fix it when we get on the field. When it's that time, it's that time we just go into that mode. Hell, yeah. That, that, sh that could be a T-shirt. Should and could be. <laughs> uh, but – that mode on Saturday was holding Wingate, Wingate excuse me, to 4 of 14 on third down. They had a, you guys had a big fourth down stop as well inside of that contest. Seven sacks on the day. You get on there on one of them. And the big thing for me going through kind of the play-by-play, -play, I didn't tune into much of it live, unfortunately. I missed out. Uh, but you guys didn't allow that offense to stay in rhythm, it really looked like. These third downs they're going for, uh, this isn't third and short that they're going to. These are, They aren't getting chunk yardage on first and second down. These are third and six, third and six seven third and eight sometimes even longer third and 11 because you have those sacks you're getting the, that negative yardage what allows you guys to get off that solid pass rush I'm assuming a lot of it is just keeping those guys off rhythm on first and second down yes our coaches always preach us preach to us that we should always win first down because you win first down it's more possibility that you're going to get a three and out more possibility mm -hmm. you might get a turnover so it's just we always want to win the first down and Credit to our D-line. Our D-line got fabulous pressure. They have a good O-line. So our D-line, when they got their one-on-one -on -one pass rushes, they were able to create pressure, and it gave the linebackers uh, time to come and finish it off because the quarterback would step up into the pocket. Hell yeah. Not often do you hear a pass rush described as fabulous, but I think it needs to happen more often and uh, very deservingly so in this uh, kind of case scenario here. We talked about maybe the struggles offensively running the ball. The stat for you here, Christian, since 2000 as a triple option team, Carson Newman had never won a game rushing for less than 100 yards until Saturday. That is just very uncharacteristic of a team with your guys' style of play and your offense. You live and you die by that sword like Dan Campbell on fourth down, <laughs> but the key takeaways, the other big plays, they make up for that in the aggregate. Is it encouraging to know that a team like you guys that runs this style, you have the supporting cast on the other side of the ball and some other big plays that you can still win games even when maybe that bread and butter is not going your way? Yeah, well, we have a great offense. We have a we went up against an experienced defensive line. Again, one of the best defenses in the country, Wingate has. But our guys were put to the test and they – we found ways to get into the end zone. That was we found ways to move the ball. It was just one of the things that we always pre the coaches always preached and we always wanted to work on. So yes, we have a long way to go, but it yeah, got the job done. Hell yeah, you did. And that's we talk a lot about like coming out with a win in this kind of game where you can learn a lot of lessons about yourself and your team, but also get the result that you want to and get the W in the win column. You talk about the experience on the other side of the ball, and I know Coach talked about it too in some of the post game that there were a lot of graduate students on that defensive line for Wingate, guys for the Bulldogs that have a ton of game experience against really competitive opponents, and so for you guys to go out and get that experience against that kind of front, that's going to set you up very well down the road. Talk to me, though, about Coach Ingram, about what he's brought to this team, maybe both schematic 
schematically and kind of mentally? Mentally, he wants he wants us to be the toughest team in America. He's preached that to us since he got here. He he said that in his interview when he got the job. You know, he wants us to be a physical bunch. He always preaches the toughness. He always preaches my, our mindset has to be strong mentally. We can't just be physical. We have to be mentally strong. We can't let – we can't have no bad penalties. And he's just brought a culture there that is undescribed. We go by brotherhood. Brotherhood is our motto because we got to be the closest team in the country. The toughest and the closest, closest team in the country is what he wants us to be, and that's what we're trying to be. That is a dangerous combination, my man, and it feels like you guys are, are certainly on the cusp of, of really attaining that. Obviously, some big-time games down the road for you guys, but this start is one that I'm excited to continue to follow along with. Christian, thank you for spending some time with me tonight, brother. That's all I got for you. All right, thank you so much. Of course. Have a good rest of your night. You too. All right, let's talk about some Division Three football, and we will start with one of the most exciting games of the weekend, that being number two, Cortland, Jimmy, versus number 11, Susquehanna. This was a game last year, Cortland's only blemish on their record throughout the regular season. And uh, Riverhawks almost got their get back again, 40-38. to Cortland squeaks out this one. Very tough start for the Red Dragons. Yeah, they came. They were down early, 24-7, to but uh, they battled back quickly. To get that uh that victory. Uh Zach Boyd's a little bit quiet through the air. He kind of anticipated him throwing for a lot of passing yards, but he made up for on the ground with 97 rushing yards and two touchdowns. Uh Josh Ehrlich from Susquehanna also had a heck of a game. 317 passing yards and four touchdowns. Uh great teams can come back from big deficits. Yeah. And we saw that today. Or not today, I'm sorry, Saturday. But um it always helps when you have Zach Boys on your side. I was really surprised they didn't throw a touchdown. Yep. I was looking at that box score. I'm like, no way. How did they score 40 points without throwing a touchdown? It's kind of wild. A couple of Zach boys touchdowns, like the one I'm showing right there. But, I mean, 24-7, to and you're Cortland, on the road. This is not maybe the toughest environment ever to play in over at Susquehanna, but on the road, down by three scores, this is something that uh, not many offenses are built to come back and do. Now, granted, it was early on still in the first half. Cortland had more than enough time to come back and get things going offensively, and we start to see that here with two back-to-back -back scores to get things uh, close to evened up. And uh, just like that, it was 24-20, and all of a sudden it was just anyone's game all over again. A couple of big turnovers definitely did not help Cortland in this one. But like you said, Good teams find a way. Cortland, Cortland, excuse me, certainly did find a way in this one. And, yeah, 182 yards, 13 of 21 passing for boys. No touchdowns, but no giveaways. Very big time uh, in that margin. Josh Elric for Susquehanna, though. 19 for 33, 314, and four touchdowns through the air, Jimmy. That's uh, not a name we've talked about maybe enough on this show. Sorry, is it, is it Elric or is it Ehrlich? Because I have it on here as Ehrlich. I could have it wrong. EHR, I could be totally butchering it. But EHR, that okay. just shows how much maybe we should be talking about him more because yeah. he has had himself ah. a day. Yeah, any Susquehanna fans, please tell us how to pronounce Josh's last name. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> but no, then this yeah, one. It's got to be Ehrlich. It's got to be Ehrlich. I don't know. It definitely could be. But uh, this one definitely uh, was a very interesting finish. And it, uh, you know, it came down to right near the end of the contest. Uh, it, really, though, two minutes and 20 seconds left, and uh, Cortland scores to go ahead 40-31. Susquehanna drove down and, and did score a touchdown with 31 seconds left, but the game was just too far out of reach at that point, and Cortland had kind of already put a bow on this one. So um, it, kind of a learning moment maybe for Cortland early on in the year, and I guess when you look ahead at their schedule, I don't believe – there wasn't a single game on their schedule this year they weren't favored in. That one's probably the toughest contest they'll have all the way until you look at games the last two of the season uh, at Brockport and then at home versus Ithaca for the Cortica Jug game. Yeah, that's always a fun one. You, know, you do go on the road at Utica in uh, three weeks here, it looks like, October 12th. That's certainly not a gimme, and they're going to have a couple other games that I'm sure will be decent contests in between now and then. But uh, to get this one out of the way and have a win, I'm sure the Red Dragon fans are pretty happy about. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I would like to mention, though, Susquehanna was 16-point underdogs in this game. Yeah. 16-point underdogs. That was an easy cover for them. But uh, I would have picked them plus 16. I think 16 is a lot of points at home. But uh, obviously, they're, not, they're probably not too worried about covering. They've rather just got the victory. But, you know, what they say, good teams win, great teams cover. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. 
Yeah, they certainly uh, they certainly did that. Let's talk and move over to our pick for the uh, quote unquote game of the week. That being UMHB going into Whitewater and coming out with a result that I think the entire nation, when it comes to D3 football, was incredibly shocked about, myself included, the Crusaders. They go in to number three in the country, 35-17, and pick up the win at Perkins Stadium, in part much due to plays like this, the pick six in the first half that got things going for the Crusaders in that opening score. Their defense was all over the place, back-to-back-to-back drives, I do believe, with takeaways through the air for the crew. Yeah, this is one of those games where I would have taken Whitewater with the points. We're looking at spread. Because it was 18 points, the over under was 39, which was like yeah. a staggeringly low number. Um, but you know, you look at last year's schedule when Mary, when Mary Hunter and Baylor played River Falls, they play this YAC team and they get their the break speed off of them, right? Mm-hmm. And then now they go into Whitewater and generate five interceptions defensively as well. Dude, don't know the that. first two five touchdowns, picks, pick sixes, five we just saw picks. the second of them. That is insane. Yeah, that's ridiculous. They Mary Hunter and Baylor ran the ball really well. Cameron Ferguson had 112 yep. rushing yards, one of them. I get some credit there and a touchdown too. He had himself a heck of a game. And uh, anytime you can go into Perkins Stadium and win by 18 points, they're up 35 10, by the way, at one point. Yes. 21 nothing in the first. And that's where you're like, I-, I was refreshing the scoring page because I thought there may be a mistake. Like, that's just something that you do not expect. But like you said, 35 10 late in the third quarter. This game was all but put away already. The fourth quarter, they finished the deal. Uh, Whitewater does manage to uh, score on a punt return uh, late in the fourth, uh, you know, kind of four minutes left in the fourth. But this one was just, it was pretty obvious what our kind of game of the week would be here. Yeah, and I know I, w- I was doing a little bit of research about, like, Whitewater, like, the history of Whitewater football. I was looking through, like, year by year by year their schedule. I couldn't find a time where they lost by 18 points in the regular season, that is. Yeah. I am curious when the last time they lost the game by 18 points was. I really would like to know. Because I went through, and, like, on, like, the history, I could I just could not find one. But I know there's at some point they had to have, but I just – Yeah. Maybe I need to do some more extension, extensive research, but uh, – yeah, and yeah. Jason, uh, is it Saniti, the the typical starter for that Warhawk offense? He was one for five, eight yards, and three interceptions. Now, it had come out, I believe, from a different source that he was battling like an illness, and, and that was part of the reason why he came out of the game as well. Uh, the other part of the reason, I'm assuming, was the three balls that he threw to the defense. Uh, but Jackson yeah. Chris comes in and actually puts together a pretty respectable stat line, 20 for 33, 236, did have the two interceptions, two more takeaways. That might be a record in itself for this Crusader defense. Yeah, five five picks is incredible. That's you got to they got to be leading the nation in picks now. I mean, that's a I would play. imagine. I yes. have to imagine what they have. They held Whitewater too. I think that's something that maybe got lost. Talk about how they ran the ball pretty well. They held Whitewater to eighty eight yards on the ground on thirty seven carries. That I feel like is a really good stat. Um, that might that's be even more. Maybe impressive. got overlooked because of the turnover yeah. margin. Yeah, that might even be just as impressive, if not more, because like Whitewater's obviously like their whole culture revolves around pounding the rock, right? Like that's yes. their identity physical tough football it also though when you go down early it's a lot harder to run the football and i think that kind of threw whitewater off completely just being down early but um and also it's like when you're down early you're gonna have to throw the ball a lot more which means probably more interceptions too it's just with one comes two comes three comes four comes five it's just <laughs> yeah the domino effect not good but they'll and really be fine they'll clean it up they, they're whitewater like yeah when you look at this but, box score too and, and they kind of fight their way back into it. Whitewater scored on two punt return touchdowns. I mean, their offense was abysmal. They could not get anything going. And you look at the, the two teams, two of 13 and three of 14 on third down. And Whitewater was one of five on fourth down. They actually were dominant in the time of possession, 35 minutes to 25. But that's because all the scores for the Crusaders came off those pick sixes. They didn't even have to possess the ball to actually score the football. Um, it, it just... Very, very tough showing for this squad all around. And and now we're going to learn a lot about this Warhawk team in general moving forward because with a loss like this now, you're going to have to really come out and play some of your best ball with some really great WIAC teams on the horizon. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they finish out because obviously the WIAC is just the most the most competitive conference in Division Three. But Whitewater's always been in that one and two spot. But I don't know, maybe is this the year they're not in the top? Is this year they missed the playoffs? Like, no, we'll have to see. But obviously, like you said, Whitewater's a program. Just that Wyack is deep, man. It's really deep. 
That's the thing. It almost feels like this could be the window that a, uh, a lacrosse, obviously, who has been there, but maybe even like a River Falls, who we've seen has been playing football, especially offensively, at an outstanding clip. This could just be that window and the door starting to crack open, if you will, and and maybe a, a little bit of a preview of what's to come at the end of the WIAC here and, and, and seeing a different team on top. Yeah. There's always, there's always a chance for anyone to win it. 100%. Yeah, but that was uh, – you know, you look at the rankings, and UMHB certainly deserved their jump in the uh, the national poll this week. But we can continue and move on in the game that maybe I don't think you and I, either of us, expected to be nearly as competitive as it was, and that's kudos uh, to the streaks over at John Carroll. But Mount Union, they do end up winning this one, 37-31, hosting John Carroll. And this is a game, too, that would have been, I think, right up there with the Whitewater upset as far as, like, you know, how monumental this outcome would have been for this John Carroll squad. Talk to me about what you saw in this one. No, really tough loss here. Picking up their second loss of the year now, but they've lost to these two elite programs yes. in Whitewater and uh, Mount Union. But obviously, you lose that third game, the playoff chances start dwindling very quickly. Um, Mount Union just continues to impress. I mean, 37 points, not, not as many points. I mean, maybe have anticipated them scoring or maybe a little bit more considering John Carroll's defense is pretty strong. That over yes. being 50. So actually, they did definitely score more points than anticipated. But the spread was at 17. John Carroll did cover that spread. So that's a pretty solid outing for them. Anytime you lose a mountain even by six, then you're expected to lose by three scores. You know, you got to hang your head on a pretty solid game. But there's no moral victories in this, no. in this game we play, uh, especially against your rival. Um, Nick, sorry, I'm going to totally botch his name. Nick Semtenflutter. Nick Semtenflutter had a heck of a game. Yep. Mount Union, 325, four touchdowns. Um, you know, I think I may have pronounced that right, actually. There were just so many – such a long name. So many yeah, syllables. but you look at what they did on the ground, man. Yeah. I mean, 268 yards on the day, excuse me, for yeah. this uh, Mount Raider – or Mount the Raider offense, the Mount Union Raider offense. They were dominant on the ground. I think that was probably the deciding factor in how you win a game like this so decidedly against kind of some nationally ranked competition. They also hold John Carroll to 77 yards on the day, which was, again, kind of the sticking point uh, for this offense. They had two guys over 110 yards on the ground and uh, combined for four touchdowns there as well. There were just a lot of things going for the Purple Raiders in this one. Um not too much else to be said. I, I don't really think so. The John Carroll had a lot going on through the air. I think you had mentioned it earlier on. A couple key turnovers, but uh, this one was pretty, pretty wrapped up. I mean, the, this offense from Mount Union. I think the biggest thing that I, stands out to me was the big play opportunities, and we saw a couple of them in the highlights playing there. Is that uh, they gashed this defense very well, and they only had three or excuse me nine third downs on the day. They were four of nine, which isn't maybe incredible, but that that means really though they're busting open these plays and they're not having to really sustain drives. They're just going down the field in chunk plays uh, and scoring on them. They they didn't really force that John Carroll defense didn't force this Purple Raider offense into a lot of uncomfortable situations. Yeah, and in order to win a game like that, you're gonna have to do things make the other team uncomfortable and they didn't quite do enough but they battled them they battled i give them that yeah, i mean they were up in the second quarter 14 13 john carroll was this was not like a uh wire to wire type game from mount union but nonetheless good time victory big time victory for them let's talk about a game i was pretty excited about salisbury versus number six johns hopkins they came into the week at number 25 and the seagulls with a big time W, 41 to 13, in a fashion that, again, neither you and I would have expected. Maybe we should start going on the record and keeping track of game picks because uh, this would have been a, a one in the wrong column for both of us, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, going in as 12 and a half point underdogs to win outright by 28 points as such big underdogs is ridiculous. Also, something that's really interesting John Johns Hopkins was winning this game at half 13 yep. to 10. And just a Absolute swarm of seagulls in the second half took place with 31 unanswered points. I mean, not to mention they also ran for 254 yards as well. And, you know, I just have a lot of questions for this John Hopkins offense because last year like, we saw how – what were they last year? Like 45 for 59 in the red zone scoring touchdowns? Yeah. They're just not scoring many, many touchdowns. Like, I just don't know what's going on. And I'm sure they're having this conversation in their offices like, why aren't we scoring points? And, honestly, I don't have an answer. Because I was expecting a heck of a season out of Johns Hopkins, and it's not appearing that it's going to go in that direction. After a loss like this, especially, I just have no, I have no idea. 
Yeah, they were dominant on the ground. I think that's something that they've certainly, it appears to maybe have lost this year. It's just they have not been able to maintain that. Two of 14 on third down in this one. And that, I think, is probably the biggest number in that they cannot keep their drives alive. Although those black uniforms are so sick. that It's yeah. definitely one of the best yeah. in the country. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, that does not save you in these kind of circumstances. I was uh, just about to say that. <laughs> They are badass. Um, but no, I think I think that's the biggest thing for me is is on the ground, whether it be offensively or defensively, they let up almost 250 yards of net rushing on the day from the Seagull, the Seagull squad. And you're just not going to win a game when those stats are not in your favor. I mean, that goes back to the rushing stats. Yes, they actually won the time possession battle, which was a little bit surprising for me looking at just the box score. Um, but otherwise, I mean... Just kind of disappointing for this squad that, uh, you know, obviously there were high hopes for coming off the, the run that they had last year. Yeah, that's not what we were expecting whatsoever. But Salisbury, they keep climbing up. They have two pretty huge wins now on their resume. And they're building quite a case for a uh, playoff bid. Yeah, looking at their schedule moving forward uh, for Salisbury here. I'm pulling it up here quickly, but uh, 3-0 right now. You talk about the last two weeks, obviously that, that previous one at home against number 18, Muhlenberg, and then you go now to a couple games that, again, I wouldn't consider a quote-unquote break for the Salisbury offense, but um, at home against Christopher Newport and then uh, on the road at William Patterson, Montclair State, Rowan, they're – they have a really good chance to run the table this year. If you're the Seagull squad and you look at their schedule ahead, and um, obviously we're allowed to do that. They're not allowed to do that. But um, looking ahead at their schedule, there's a really good chance that the squad can come out of this uh, with no blemishes on their record. Yeah. I'm sure there, a lot of them are thinking it, but no one's saying it. No, they better not be, or else that's a very easy way to, to screw that yeah. and ruin it. Yeah, certainly. We'll move on. This one, Barry picks up a big-time win against Randolph-Macon, 28-24 on the road. This Randolph-Macon squad, maybe not what we expected once again. Jimmy, what did you see in this one? Yeah, we had our concerns a little bit last week with Randolph-Macon not winning super convincingly, and it showed up this week. Uh, I took a loss to a game they were expected to win. However, this was one of the closer spreads we had. It was only two and a half points leaning towards Randolph-Macon. The over-under sitting at 53 and a half, which was under by just a point and a half. So I'm sure there are some people sweating over that potentially. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Barry, Barry took the lead in the final minutes of the game with a touchdown from Brandon Cade with uh, 60 rushing yards and two touchdowns. Stud. Uh, yeah, and I, I was surprised. I, I thought they would have ran the ball for a little like more effectively, but I mean they're scoring on the ground, so I guess that was good. But um, yeah, Cade's been having a heck of a year. I was 60 yards. I was like, oh, I wonder if it was only 60. Yeah. No, I mean, this this Randolph-Macon defense last year, they were allowing 2.5 yards per carry, and they're allowing less than 70 yards per game on the ground. And I think that was what led to a lot of their uh, success offensively. When you look at this one, they kind of kept that up. I mean, under 70 yards for this Barry team, but it was the explosive plays that got them, and it was uh, some of the plays through the air. Also, the, turno the turnovers, right? That turnover margin is something that uh, – uh, maybe didn't go in their favor, but it, it feels like they're checking some of the same boxes as last year with that run defense, and they're just not having the same results. So for me, again, not a game that I had the chance to tune into, so I couldn't tell you like the ups and downs of that. We had too much going on this weekend with uh, homecoming up here at Northern, which unfortunately we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, this one is looking forward for Randolph-Macon. It's, it's going to be interesting. You uh, don't have any – I guess – Again, quote unquote big time matchups. It's hard to tell though with this squad because that's all relative, right? Moving forward, there's not many uh, ranked teams uh, on the horizon for this Randolph Macon squad. So potentially still have a lot of room to bounce back. Yeah, always room to bounce back. You know, there's a lot of football to play. So. Yeah, they do start ODAC play next week at uh, Shenandoah. So um, if you're going to start it, it may as well be inside of conference play. Let's move over to our last kind of highlighted game of the day. This one, I'm kind of it's kind of semi excited to talk about. We haven't talked about our guy Louis Berrios under center um, at Delaware Valley in a while. We are going to talk about Delval today, and it's not because of a stat line that he put up, but rather Stevenson picking up a 21 to 20 win over the Aggies there. And this was a pretty monumental win for that squad over there, huh, Jim? Yeah, and the defense stepped up big time for them. You know, anytime you were a huge underdog like they were at 19 and a half points, you're going to have to have big plays and turnovers. And that's exactly what they did. 
Jovan Terrell with two interceptions to uh, bolster that defense up. And there's a, a big what if play. There's a missed extra point with five minutes to go to tie the game. And obviously at the end of the game, uh, Makai Harvey had a game ceiling interception. But man, oh man. Anytime you think about a missed extra point, you lose by one. Yeah. yeah. No, that is that is ridiculous. Um, and the over get... under for this game was forty two, and it finished at forty one, and just a mixed extra point from most likely overtime because <laughs> no one yes. scored. Just wild stuff there. Wild you can stuff. definitely assume uh, when you look at the the history of this game. Right, I think there's some big numbers that stand out. And uh, you go back, the last time that Stevenson won this game was back at home in 2016. And that's notable for a couple of reasons. One, because that's the last time that Stevenson beat Delaware Valley. That's also the last time anyone in their conference beat Delaware Valley. Jimmy, they've been on an absolute tear inside of conference oh, play. And yeah. uh, this win is is monumental in that way because – this Delaware Valley team has owned the conference for a long time, and and this could be a uh, changing of the guard, a uh, changing of the throne, I guess, whatever kind of analogy you want to use. Essentially, yeah, there's no reason why there can't be, you know. But I think I actually do remember talking about that a bit last year with you. We were previewing a Delaware Valley game. It may have been when we had them, uh, we unveiled their new football show. What was that, like last year? I mean, we were talking about their crazy, like, conference win streak. I did not actually have that here, but – um Good yeah, know that. Very the good Middle Atlantic that. Conference. That that they were on a yeah. in the uh, in the MAC. They were on a fifty-four game winning streak. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot of wins. That's hard to do. That is incredibly hard to do. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to go through too while we were while we were on this. I was gonna go through and find that uh, interception late because I know this is kind of a longer highlight video wise here. Let's see. I believe this is it. But, yeah, I wanted to make sure I I highlighted that before we got off of it. But, yeah, I mean, what a what a monumental win for this squad, and that could uh, spell a lot of success for them down the road. Looking at their schedule the rest of the way for Stevenson, they go – they're back at home, sorry, against Alvernia this week. And then on the road, Widener, Albright, going into conference play here. And when you open up with that kind of win, the rest of the year really is is everything is in front of them, right? There's They've got this win under their belt, and now it's it's kind of their conference to lose. At this point, I think it's kind of maybe the overreaction, but uh, that's kind of what it feels like looking at the streak that DelVal was on. Yeah. I mean, I, I there's no reason why they can't come, come back and win the rest of the games they have this season. You know, I, But like you said, you never know. Yep. I'm with you there. So we got a couple of games that we just wanted to mention semi quickly um, without going into too much in depth here. Number 17, Alma, they come up here and they beat Northern Michigan 44 27. Carter St. John, we know this, but I'm going to remind everyone he's a dog. He's incredibly crafty. He has great pocket presence and awareness. Northern had absolutely zero pressure on him on the day, too, so that makes a lot of quarterbacks look really good. Um, but he also just happens to be very good at playing football and very good at throwing the football. He threw for, I believe, four touchdowns in that one. And, and I talk about craftiness. Like, he moves around in the pocket and just dishes the ball off potentially at the last moment or finds people open. He's incredibly gifted at kind of that scramble drill, right? The backyard football where you have receivers moving around across the across the field and things don't go right, and he's able to get completions. Ty Lauterman, the hometown kid, comes up here and has 140 yards and like two tuds. I was just about to say that. I was going to say Ty Lauterman, the hometown kid. I was literally going to say that. What a homecoming for him. And, and, and just watching that game, you definitely are a little excited for him to come yeah. back here to where he grew up and, and was at high school and those kind of things. And, and have that kind of performance that's awesome like that that's really cool and Alma just this this northern Michigan squad I mean we've talked a couple of times about the, the d3 opponents unfortunately back-to-back -back weeks with uh, lacrosse and and now Alma but it's really hard for a d2 like northern in a spot in their program where they're at where they're just struggling to pick up any win whatsoever to schedule two d3s but then two d3s that are arguably two of the top 10 15 teams in the country depending on who you ask yeah, I mean, I don't know if they're scheduling those games like just to win them, or I don't know. I, again, they're all, they're scheduled every game to win, but I feel like if you pick out D three teams, like you you think you would, I don't know. You know, you know what I'm getting at. It's just like yeah, especially know. like your homecoming game, right? This was homecoming yeah. for Northern, and you go out and schedule this Alma squad. So 
it's it's really tough, man. And and for Northern, it's like it, you start to wonder when, when things are going to shake because this is they're on a skid right now that is that is truly truly bad. And as someone who has graduated from here and works here, it sucks. It sucks to watch. It sucks to watch the product, and you feel for the guys because it's not the guys want to win. You know what I mean? You feel for the guys out there, and it's really hard really hard to watch. Yeah. I remember we went one and nine my freshman year in Northern and that was really bad. But yeah. they, they lost like 15 in a row. Now I think like I, uh, just, it's just brutal. Like you said, it is, it's, just, it's, it's like uh, just really hard to be a part of the program, but let's talk about that lacrosse team that beat up on Northern last week. Number five lacrosse, they go into number two in division two GVSU and scare the shit out of the Lakers. GVSU ends up winning 20 to 13, Jimmy, but this game was so back and forth with some great quarterback play from lacrosse. Avery Moore, the quarterback from GV, not in this one. He was banged up from their game against CSU Pueblo last week. That certainly contributed to some of the offensive struggles, excuse me, for the Lakers. But nonetheless, man, this lacrosse squad, that is a, that would have been the upset of the year to go into Lubbers in a night game, a seven o'clock kick and take down the Lakers. And hey, those wire teams are tough, man. I tell you what. Um, I mean, Grand Grand Valley obviously huge favorite in this one at twenty one and a half, and they had no chance to cover this one. They uh, uh, lacrosse super impressed with them. Um, honestly, I'm not like shocked they kept it this close. So I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, I would have been shocked if they won the game, but if you would have told me they lost by seven, I've been. The only reason I think I was so surprised is watching their defense against Northern Michigan last week and Mm -hmm. and just seeing some kind of blatant holes and miscues on the defensive side of the ball, I think had some question marks for me, especially the way Grand Valley had been running the the ball, excuse me, going into this contest. I thought it was going to be a ground and pound at the line of scrimmage type of game where they just dominated time possession and had long drives, but... That was not the case. Otherwise, number 15, Wartburg, they hold off Central 10-6. to six. thought that was kind of a noteworthy outcome. And then the last one was uh, Lakeland winning a shootout versus Concordia Chicago, two teams you don't talk about too much, 66-61. to 61. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I saw a stat line for this Lakeland kid, by the way. I thought it was fake. What's was that? that? What was that? Like, cra- wasn't there like some crazy stat line for some kid at Lakeland? Uh, I, I believe the Chicago had quarterback had a ridiculous day. Oh, yeah, I don't know maybe. if the box score pulled up right now. Yeah, I'm going to pull it up. I don't have that box score. Oh, man. He certainly did, though. Yeah, it was like the craziest style I've ever seen. If I saw it. <laughs> I, I might have like, read it wrong. I think like, I might have read two players next to each other or something by chance, but. Where is no, this? I hear you. But, yeah, definitely at least worth mentioning because um, – and I can pull it up real quick. Hold on. Let me uh, – I'm digging at it myself. I'm to... I'll pull because I had that. You actually have it down. Oh, like we do our player. we do our player of the week nominees, and I know I had. I believe it was their quarterback in for the nominee for one of the players of the week for D three, and uh, here it is right here. Colton Bosch, twenty one for thirty four, four hundred and three yards, five touchdowns, and a pick. Oh, okay, I, that, that wasn't the stat I stuff. That's still really really good. Four hundred yards, five touchdowns. Yeah, you do also have uh, Michael Robbie. Um, had a, a ridiculous day for Lakeland as well. He was 17 for 36 through the air, 335 and four tuds, but then had 18 carries for that 200 yards and three There's touchdowns. Yeah, he's the player of the week. I mean, are you kidding me? Two That's got to be one. Yards? He's on there. He's on the list, and that yeah, post is going to be out tomorrow. We delayed it this week with the College right. Football Network, but he is certainly on there. Um, my vote is for uh, him. I Robbie, mean, that's yeah. 335, four touchdowns passing, and 204 and three on the ground. How does he not win? That's absurd. Like, That's the thing, though. Every week, bro, we get these stat lines, and it's like, okay, how he's got to win it. And then you find two or three more guys, and you're like, holy shit. No, there's no way anyone's topping this. Unless someone threw for, like, 600 yards and eight I will say, too, though, we, like, what we do factor in is, like, competition as well. So if you're playing, like, a nationally yeah. ranked opponent versus, like, Concordia Chicago, like, we're going to weigh that differently. The stat line is still ridiculous. He's not a shoe in though, I wouldn't say. Yeah, I mean, what is it then? 539 and seven touchdowns. That's outrageous. That is outrageous. It's stupid, dude. It's a video game. I thought, because I thought that was fake. Really. I thought I like read two players in a row. I'm like, oh, <laughs> the same line or something. I'm like, no, that's real. <laughs> that's yes, real. bro. Yeah, uh, it that's... is. No, we, we'll have all those hey, released tomorrow. They're Gatron, a little bit delayed. Gatron Bev- Beverly for Lakewood. Five for 99, a touchdown. Uh, the old Wildcat just popped up on the box score here. Shout out yep. to Jake. You're listening. But I think that's all we got for this week, Jim. 
Sweet. Always really good football. Through. Really good football yep. being played. I wish I didn't get to tune in too much of it this week because we had stuff going on up here. But uh, glad to, glad to break it down with you, brother. As always. Yes, sir. Take care. See you, man. We'll move over to the NAIA scene. Let's start things off with a fantastic game. Number 20 coming into the weekend. Southern Oregon. They visit number nine, College of Idaho. The Yotes trying to rebound from a tough loss against Montana Western. They wouldn't get it. Uh, Southern Oregon comes in here, and they put on a show. And the final of this one being 45 to 27 certainly not something i expected once again matt not joining me tonight but i would have guaranteed that he probably would not have predicted that result either this squad looked really good like wire to wire they start things off 14 nothing gunner yates a 10 yard and then a 68 yard touchdown run we're going to talk about a lot about him here in a minute because that would not be the only times he did that on the night but this southern oregon squad really looked dominant on the ground game offensively and defensively these highlights I'm showing right here are all from the second half. And when you look at some of the team stats from this one, you go down 258 yards on the ground for Southern Oregon in this one. That feels like a really, really good number. 571 yards of total offense there. And two interceptions to go on top of that. So you're getting the takeaway battle. You're winning the ground battle. Time of possession was almost 37 to 23 minutes in favor of Southern Oregon. This is just all these different things going in their favor. They really feels like they dominated this matchup across the board and really was not expecting this from College of Idaho, expected them to bounce back. But we see the dominance as uh, I'm kind of going through it right now. A big part of that dominance, the graphic I'm about to show you right now, Gunnar Yates and the day that he had for SOU, absolutely ludicrous. Take a look at this stat line. 31 carries, 293 yards, four touchdowns against the number nine team in the country. That's just not something you see every day. That is different. That is absolutely different. Here's a cut up of some of those touchdowns here. Starting things off with his quick uh, almost 10 yard touchdown running in between the tackles off to the right side there. Nothing too crazy. The next one. That's where it started to get ridiculous. Was a 68-yard touchdown that I'm sure we'll get to here in just a second. Back in their own territory, right on the 30-yard line, through the tackles, cuts out left, and he's just outrunning Yote defenders here down the sideline. Goes for the ankle, kind of the trip up there. Not even a chance. Yates pulls away. What a career day for Gunnar Yates in the Southern Oregon offense. I'll continue to let these play as I talk a little bit more about this contest because, oh my goodness, you just got to respect that stat line. Now, the schedule moving forward for the Raiders out of Southern Oregon, it's not exactly easy. They're at home against number four, Montana Western. Then you go on the road at number 10, Montana Tech, two teams we've talked about religiously on this program. It's really tough next couple of weeks, but right now, the momentum that this team has, they're 3-0, coming off a great home win, and this is just, it feels like all the momentum in the world is going up right now for this Raider offense and this Raider team in general. I am very excited to see what this Southern Oregon's, other, or Oregon excuse me, squad can pull off. I have not been tuned into enough of their games. That is going to change these next couple of weeks. I tell you that right now. I'm absolutely going to be tuned in. But we'll keep moving forward on the NAI scene. How about Ottawa, Kansas versus McPherson? The Bulldogs from McPherson picking up a 31 to 14 victory. Led 14 7 at the half, outscored them 17 7 in the second half. That's a good recipe for success. Uh, Zabo, Tristan Zabo, excuse me, 10 of 16, 208 yards and two touchdowns through the air. Helped out that Jaleel Brown had 19 touches for 100 yards and a tud on the ground. Their defense. Certainly stepped up as well. Rochelle Christ Christopher Rochelle, excuse me, had an interception. And then a couple TFLs from a couple different guys. Jequez Wilson was one of them. But McPherson, we've talked about them a couple times now on the show. They certainly have deserved it. The Bulldogs sit at 3-1 and one right now after an opening weekend loss. They've got Avila, Kansas Wesleyan, Bethel College coming down the pipeline with three ranked foes to finish out their last three weeks of the season, Evangel, Friends, and Southwestern. So, again... A team like McPherson, McPherson, excuse me, you had a loss early. Everything's still on the table 
for the Bulldogs moving forward. Let's go down, though, to one of those couple of those squads in conference we were talking about. Avila made a visit to Bethel. The Thrashers come out, Threshers, excuse me, come out with a 20 to 70 win. Got a little bit of video from the post game of the Threshers in that environment. Looked like kind of a, looked like kind of a rainy game type atmosphere. Great, great football environment. You can see it there. They pick up the 20 to 17, 17 win and uh, offensively had a lot of great things going. Incredibly efficient. DJ Sears through the air, 9 of 17, 121, three touchdowns. And then Toriano Richar, hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, 24 carries, 122 yards. Like to see that from this squad, excuse me. And uh, I think a big piece of this, too, when you look defensively for them, Tate Seabolt had a sack, an interception, had uh, four other guys registering TFLs. So across the board, a great defensive effort for both these squads. And this Bethel, Bethel team is proving themselves early inside of conference play. When you look at it going forward, in the KCAC, I mean, they're 4-0 right now. All those games being inside of the conference in the KCAC. And a lot of great games still ahead of them. They certainly have not locked it up, but they are definitely at the forefront of the conversation in the conference right now. Let's keep things moving. How about Graceland University? We talked about one of the couple of their players last week. Uh, in what was an offensive explosion. This week, not so much. Mid-American Nazarene, who came into the week at number 19 in the country, they end up taking the win in this one. Got some highlights for you from this matchup from MNU. 38-24, to they take this one. Things were tied up at 21 at the half. Mid-American Nazarene outscores them 17-3 to in the second half. And that was just kind of the, the tale of two halves. It's like they separated themselves in that second half. A couple interceptions from the Nazarene side certainly helped things in that manner. Adrian Parsons, we have talked about a little bit. He was almost surgical. 25 of 39, 263 and three touchdowns through the air. Had a lot of big time plays for that MNU squad. Cameron Finley added 100 yards on the ground, a touchdown of his own. EJ Rogers led them receiving with six catches for 93 yards defensively is where they did a lot of things well. Maxwell Weber had uh, one of the takeaways through the air, and then Kevin uh, Ledesma Garcia had an interception as well. But uh, this Mid-American Nazarene squad, certainly, like I said, has a lot of things going for them moving forward. Uh, Matt would be able to give you a little bit more detail, but right now, when you look at their first two weeks, they hadn't been tested at all. You talk about the out-of-conference play. Culver Stockton, Peru State, both big-time victories. This was probably their first semi-test from a Graceland squad and an offense over there that uh, you know gave them a little bit, maybe a little bit of a hiccup there in the first half. They go on the road at St. Ambrose, and that will be a good indicator to this coming weekend. Uh, and they've got one more matchup there before they get into Hart Conference play. And uh, the back half of that Hart Conference schedule is going to be tough. But... If you're Mid-America Nazarene, you handle your business out of, out of conference. You go into those with a lot of confidence heading into conference play. Let's stay right in talking about one of those Hart Conference teams. How about Benedictine and their win over St. Ambrose, who will actually be playing MNU this coming week. Here are some of the highlights from that one. The final score from this one, Benedictine takes it 45-14. to And offensively... <clears throat> It was a very, very dominant contest. They went into the half up 24 to nothing over St. Ambrose, which is no slouch of a squad. I certainly want to uh, put that out there. Uh, Dooley, our guy who we had on the show here just a couple weeks back, he was absolutely balling. They opened things up with a 75-yard touchdown pass to Jay Sean Todd, and they kept things going. An 83-yard pass to Jacob Gathright. Jay Sean Todd hauled in another one from Dooley, and they just kept things going there. Uh, offensively, Benedictine was shining in this one. That's kind of uh, the big notes from that. The last one I really wanted to mention on the NAIA side of things, Northwestern College picks up a big win. They stay at number two in the rankings this week, 17-7 to over uh, GPAC foe Midland. And this one, nothing too crazy, 14-0 at half. Midland would score a touchdown, their only touchdown in the third quarter, but Northwestern hangs on. Midland, absolutely not a slouch. Northwestern, still very good at the football. But... 
that's about it for me tonight. If you can't tell, I'm almost out of breath. I'm talking about all this football, but I'm very appreciative that I get to come on here and talk about it each and every week. Let me know who I should cover, who I should be on the lookout for in the coming weeks. I'm excited to watch more small school football. For D1 Rejects, this has been Kobe Manzo.